If in your project you would like to use battery to power your board, then this video is for you because we are going to talk about batteries, charging, protection, we are going to have a look on schematics and also like uh, we will talk about how to choose the right battery for your project. Is that correct, Alex? Yes, that is correct. And Alex is going to uh, tell us everything because what you are doing, you are experts for batteries. No, you are designing these protection circuits for batteries or? Yes, that is my, my job. I design BMS systems for uh, for battery packs, mainly lithium battery packs. Okay, let's have a look. So you have uh, some kind of slides which are going to mm -hmm. help us to uh, talk about this topic. So can you open your presentation? We will talk about this schematic a yes. little bit later. But we would like to start maybe with something about batteries because there are so mm -hmm. many different kinds of batteries. So how do you, first, what kind of batteries we have and how do we decide which one to use for our project? Yeah, so there, there's a lot of options out there. There's a, there's a ton of options and then a ton of opinions about what you should do uh, as well. So uh, when you're starting with, um, with integrating batteries into your project, um, you have, there's a lot of different cell types and things uh, to look at. So um, the main two cell types, if you look here uh, at this slide, um, uh, you have like your, your what you call your primaries. So you've got your lithium primaries, like your coin cells, and there's a 123A uh, uh, cell. And then Energizer makes some uh, AA lithium cells. And then, of course, you have your alkalines. And these are non-rechargeable. They're one-time use. And then you have to throw them away and put new ones in. And then um, here's what, what I work with a lot is uh, rechargeable batteries. So batteries, 18650, 26650, pouch cells like these, nickel metal hydride cells like you buy from Amazon and things for rechargeable double A's. Um, those are uh, secondary uh, batteries that are rechargeable. So those are what normally people look at in their projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I, do want to, I do want to say this, that um, technically cells are not batteries. So when, when we're talking about cells, we're talking about a single component, a mm -hmm. single cell. And then a battery is whenever it's been put together in some kind of configuration. Mm -hmm. However, in the industry, the terms are now used interchangeably. You have some people call them single cell batteries and stuff like that. So um, this is now called a battery, but this is technically a cell. And then this is a cell stack, which makes up a battery. So. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're talking about cells, I'm talking about an individual thing. And then when I'm talking about a battery, I'm talking about an actual assembly of cells for when we go through the rest of the presentation. Okay. And for uh, even for this kind of uh, unusual re rechargeable batteries or these cells, there is some kind of standard, correct? From the picture about, uh, from the previous slide or oh, next one. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah. This one. Yeah, there are some uh, kind of standards. Yes, there are standard sizes. So um, the first type is the most common uh, uh, cylindrical cells. So they're they're round and long. This is an 18650, which is 18 millimeters by 65 millimeters. This is a 26650, which is 26 millimeters mm -hmm. by 65 millimeters. And this is one that came out a few years ago, um, uh, the 21700. So it's uh, 21 millimeters by 70 millimeters. And this one's gotten real popular. Um, a lot of your um, vacuum cleaner batteries and like the Hilti um, power um, tool batteries and stuff, they're starting to use the 21700s. You can fit a lot more energy into them and uh, they have a lot better output current. Um, so it, uh, the way cells are made is you have a, a what's called a jelly roll. So it's um, some kind of... Uh, um, of material that is um, layered up. So you've got your um, two ma two battery materials, and then there's a dielectric in between that separates them. And then they roll it up and stick it into a, a cell like this. Mm -hmm. And then they weld it up. And these are the most common standard sizes. Um, there's several custom sizes too that you can get. However, integrating those into your product, you know, if they decide to get rid of the custom size, then there goes your product, you know. Yeah, and then I've, they offer. I've seen on one of the slides you have this rectangle battery. Yeah. 
on on the yep. previous slide, yeah, number three. Yep, and we'll actually talk about those in uh, these other two slides as well. Oh, okay. These I offer, see. yeah. These offer protections too, and we'll get into protections later. But these offer CID and PTC protections. Uh, they're built in on cylindrical cells. So, what does it mean they have built in protection? Uh, we can go over that now if you want to. Okay. So, this is a slide from NASA. Uh, NASA's got a lot of good resources. They've done a ton of research into lithium batteries for sending them up into space and stuff. And so uh, this is actually from a NASA presentation. So here's how a cylindrical cell is made. You can see the jelly roll here, mm -hmm. how it's layers. And um, so um, there's a thing called a CID or a circuit inter interrupt device. And so if you see these slices here, mm -hmm. if the pressure inside of the cell builds up too much, then those two, these two plates here, will separate mm -hmm. and physically disconnect the uh, the jelly roll from the top button. Mm -hmm. So it, it physically separates inside of the cell and it never goes back together. It's a, um, it's a last resort safety device mm -hmm. to completely isolate the internals from the external. Um, also, some cells are uh, put together with what's called a, a PTC um, or a positive, you know, a positive temperature coefficient uh, type device. So if it heats up too much, it will open, not let the um, current flow anymore out of the cell, cools back down, it'll go back together. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of cells used to be built with these. Not many are anymore because most cells are going toward high current applications. And so most of your low current cells still have PTCs in them, but all of your high current applications and things like that, um, they're not uh, they're not built with PTCs anymore. They just have CIDs. I have no them. idea so, there is something like this inside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of cells, a lot of your low power cells are still built like this. And then, of course, all cells are built with a CID for emergency uh, interruption. Uh, one one little story I've got for you. So we've uh, we work with some firefighting companies at uh, at PTI. And so in order to pass firefighting testing, you have to see what the cell will do if it's put into a, um, a, uh, an abuse condition. So that used to be you take and put it on a table and you, and you have a machine that has a nail and it would just puncture the nail through the side of the cell. Well, in, in this application, it was inside of a case and it had a board and it was uh, potted in, in some uh, epoxy resin because it went into hazardous environments. You couldn't let anything leak out of it. So what we did was we took springs, battery contact springs, and we stuck them in these openings here and wound them down, screwed them down, uh, twisted them down into the top of the cell to hold the CID down mm -hmm. so it couldn't pop, so we could see what, what it would do if it shorted. So we, we held this down so it wouldn't pop out, so that way we could see what the cell would do if the CID didn't pop. So uh, just just it, the little things you do uh, to, to uh, get through testing. But um, but that's with cylindrical cells. That's uh, the, the They are the most, I guess you could say, the most common and, and the kind of the most safe as far as the lithium packages go. Uh, because of all their integrated protection. And the next is prismatic cells. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing, it has a jelly roll. Some of them have internal protections and some of them do not. It just depends on what, what your shape is. Um, these aren't as common anymore. Um, this is a Molly 10 Um We use these in a lot of our products uh, because they're, they're flat and they go um, into a lot of low power applications. Uh, but these are more um, into custom sizes. So if you've ever seen batteries like for um, electric scooters or something like that, um, where they're 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 kind of big, they're kind of big boxes with terminals on the top. Those are large format prismatic batteries. And so um, there's a lot of custom sizes of these, especially in lithium iron phosphate. There's a lot of custom sizes of these. Um, but they're not as common as a cylindrical. And then the most common... I have a question. I have a um, question. So before... Yes. So basically, you go to the slide before. Yes. So you basically place, uh, place these kind of like standard cells inside of these, or these are specially built? 
these are normally specially built. Okay, so there is maybe like foil or the jelly or something <laughs> inside of this. So these, are, yes, they will not be cells inside of this. Yes, these are these are normally specially built. Mm -hmm. That jelly roll is is rolled up inside and then put into um, the case. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, okay, just like a custom case. Mm -hmm. We can go so, to the next one because I, I've seen okay. the other. Yeah. yeah, and so cylindrical and then pouch cells. Um, these are uh, normally called polymers. However, polymer isn't just for pouch cell. Some prismatics are polymers and stuff, but um, these are pouch cells. These are the the most common that you will you will see. They're used in in almost every Internet of Things device and all of your cell phones. Um, uh, now um, they're again a jelly roll that's cased in a thin foil. So instead of it being rolled, it's folded. And then it's encased in, you know, a thin foil, uh, usually some kind of uh, aluminum or something. And uh, they're more flat. So the the bigger capacity you have, the the larger the, the area becomes. Normally they're standard thickness and then the uh, bigger the area becomes. Uh, the problem with designing with these is there's not really any common, common standards or sizes. So when you're going to integrate this into your design, no, when we've dealt with these, normally, you know, you design with, with one set of polymers. Well, the customer that were buying millions of these decided to discontinue that product and go to another one, and mm -hmm. they need one that's a few millimeters shorter and a few millimeters taller, and so it doesn't fit in your product anymore. Yeah, so that. Yeah, that's something to watch for when designing with these. But, you know, if you if you get one that's, you know, an inch by two inches, a two by one, and you kind of put a little bit of margin into your device for that to grow or shrink, usually you'd be fine. Um, and these are, are perfectly safe if they're kept within their um, safety parameters. Now, they are subject to swelling. So I have a picture. This is an original iPhone right here, and that's a battery that's swole. I that's have a little bit phone of a, like this, yeah. You have a phone like that? Um, now that's a little bit of a dramatic example, but pouch shells do swell and they'll swell 15 to 20% over their life. You know, their lifespan, your lifespan for a lithium battery, which we'll get into this later, but is about three to five years before it needs to be changed, you know, uh, depending on its use case scenario. So it'll start to swell, you know, 15, 20%. So if you're putting this type of cell in your device, you need to account for that, mm -hmm. or else you'll have the you know the phone start splitting apart and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of normal, even if it is a little bit mm -hmm. bigger, it's still kind of normal. Yes, in normal operation, they will swell. Okay, slightly. I didn't know. I thought battery mm -hmm. was like damaged when I when I've seen my phone like. <laughs> yeah. Now, if they get if they get this big, yeah, that's bad. Okay, <laughs> but you know, a, a little bit of swelling, they'll swell a little bit over time, regardless of what you do just because um, of the, the buildup of gases and pressure in them as that, um, as the electrons flow and as that um, jelly roll is worked and different things, it, it'll just generate over time. That's why uh, the cylindrical cells and stuff are so much more popular for high power applications and things because of the metal case, it doesn't swell or anything. It stays a constant shape, mm -hmm. right? Now these cannot tolerate physical abuse. Your um, you know, metal canned um, batteries can tolerate some, a little bit of physical abuse because they're encased in a, in a rigid enclosure. However, these cannot. I'm sure you've seen the the videos on YouTube where they take and they um, nail or they, something. Yeah, to put a nail through it and they swell up and explode. They just can't tolerate any physical abuse, and they normally don't offer any kind of internal protection. So no CID, no PTC. They're just straight to. Um, the cell itself, straight to the um, uh, to the jelly roll. That's there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. So if um, you would like to use something like this, you need to add uh, not only charging circuit and all this stuff, but also protection circuit. Yes, well, for any package you pick, uh, protection circuit, but especially with this one, mm -hmm. you need protection for these because they're just a little more fragile than the rest of the. The different cell types. Okay, and a little bit later um, we will explain what is inside of this protection mm -hmm. circuit. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you want to move on to cell chemistry, that's what I have. Yeah, yeah, next. yeah. I'm curious because you know there are so many batteries, and I have I always uh, keep thinking like, okay, so which one 
not only like size, but also which kind of type I should use. And then mm -hmm. also I have, I don't know, charger and charger has, I don't know, three, four different kind of modes for different mater batteries. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, there are a ton of options out there. And, um, and ever everybody, uh, everybody has their own opinion and you know, you've got uh, text instruments, analog devices. You've got all these people that make everything that can do everything, and then doesn't don't really tell you how to use it or how to implement it. So it can be, it can be uh, very daunting. Uh, when I first started doing this back, goodness, it's been seven years ago. I didn't know anything. It took me a long time to learn all of this. But, um, but uh, it's not voodoo. You don't have to, you know. Um, have a seance or whatever and call on the ghost of somebody to learn all this. You know, you can you, you can figure it out if you just know where to get started and where to look. That's why we are creating so, this video. That That's why we're creating the video. Um, so the, the first cell chemistry is, is the most common. So uh, lithium ion. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the most common type of cell chemistry. Um, normally, uh, four to... 4.2 volts peak charge, 3.6 volts nominal voltage per cell, and 2.5 volts the end of discharge. Now, this is the most energy dense of all the chemistries, rechargeable chemistries, the most energy dense. Um, uh, most chemistries are um, nickel, manganese, cobalt, that NMC cells, that is your most common. Um, there are a few different other chemistries. Uh, uh, the one that's becoming popular right now is sodium ion. It's a salt-based cell. However, I've seen in my time, I've seen a lot of different cell chemistries come up and then fall down because they just can't match an NMC um, cell. So this is still your most common an NMC cell uh, for your lithium ion cells. Now, it is the most volatile type of chemistry out of the three uh, most popular we're going to look at. It's subject to thermal runaway. So I wanted to talk about this if you want to, about what thermal runaway is. First, I would like to explain a little bit what are these uh, words like uh, most energy dense and more and, and 4.2 volt charge, nominal end of discharge. Okay, uh, we can talk about that. So um, uh, let's talk about this uh, first. The um, your peak charge voltage, your nominal voltage, and your end of discharge voltage. So I'll go to this slide here uh, to explain that. Batteries aren't power supplies. So they're, um, they have a certain capacity or an amp hour rating. So um, this is a Molly P26A data sheet. This is a 2.6 amp hour cell, which means you can draw 2.6 amps out of it for uh, about an hour's worth of runtime. And then you can math that, you know, however you want to, but uh, this is um, your discharge curve. So this is how much energy is in the battery pack. So uh, your peak charge voltage is uh, loading the most energy you can into the cell. That's topping out your 2.6 amp hours. That's at 4.2 volts. Your nominal voltage is normally here, which is in what you call your linear range. This is where the most energy is. So it'll hold 3.6 volts around that for a, a pretty good long while, and, you know, drop down between 3.6 and 3.2 for a good long while. That's your nominal voltage range. And then your end of discharge voltage is 2.5 volts. That's when your energy is fully depleted out of the cell. It's about 2.5 volts. Uh, so uh, when you're talking about uh, integrating a cell into your device, you need to, to uh, know all those parameters. Normally chargers will take care of your charge voltage, but you need to know end of discharge voltage. So that way you don't drive your cell way below what it needs to be. And then for your most energy dense, that means in this package uh, for the lithium ion, in whatever package you pick, um, you have the most energy you can get in that package. Mm -hmm. So um, take, for instance, a 26650 um, lithium iron phosphate cell around 3.6 to 4 amp hours for your high capacity cells. You can get that kind of capacity in a in a um, 21700 or uh, sometimes even an 18650 in lithium ion. Mm -hmm. So you've got a much smaller size and the same energy density. So So I have a question then why there would 
exist the other batteries. I know, for example, for RC planes, you need different special parameters of the batteries. But, you know, normally, I think the question is, if these are the best, why the other would exist? <laughs> Because of this. Um, so, uh, the mo they're the most volatile. Mm -hmm. So, they are the most unstable of all the chemistries, mm -hmm. which means that they have to be treated um, very, very strictly compared to the other chemistries. So um, lithium ion is subject to what's called thermal runaway. So I have these diagrams made up. So if you have one cell that has an internal short, that something goes wrong in it and the CID does not open, it does not correct itself, or the CID opens but it still has the short inside of the, the jelly roll and it heats up, what it's going to do is it's going to propagate that heat to the surrounding cells. Those cells will then heat up internally in short, and then those cells will go into thermal runaway, and this one will burn out. And then it just propagates for a larger and larger packs. Uh, I know you've seen a lot of electrical vehicle fires and those type of things. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. One Just one little 18650 cell goes into thermal runaway, and the whole pack is toast. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very Now, hard to uh, put off this kind of fire or something. It is uh, because um, lithium is self-fueling. So it's like wood or something like that. It'll burn until it has no material to burn. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it burns with such heat that it takes 10 times the water to put it out than it would a normal vehicle fire because mm -hmm. it burns with such heat. It burns a lot hotter than gas or diesel does. It burns so much hotter. So um, many thousands of degrees worth of heat coming off of these cells because there's so much energy in them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's the reason um, the other chemistries exist is because of this. So like we have a rule here at PTI, we only do so many cells in series and parallel. We will not build big packs because of this reason, mm -hmm. because they might be subject to thermal, run thermal runaway. Uh, Which is well, which is where if you want to, we'll go into the other chemistries and where they they shine yeah, yeah, versus yeah. lithium ion. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the second chemistry is lithium iron phosphate, um, and this is what we use to build all of our big battery packs with um, our big 24 volt modules and our big 12 volt modules. Um, now, but it is less energy dense, much less energy dense. So you've got a 3.65 volt peak charge, 3.2 volts nominal, and a 2 volt end of discharge. Mm -hmm. So again, you have about 30 to 35 percent bigger in size per cell than you do with lithium ion for mm -hmm. the same amount of energy. But these aren't subject to thermal runaway. Um, and they're not subject to uh, dendrite growth either. Oh, I did not mention that if I could go back. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's the big thing. That's one of the big things with lithium ion cells is dendrite growth. So if we go down to this slide right here, in between all, you can see the dielectric separating each end of the jelly roll mm -hmm. here. Well, the problem is if a cell is abused, and then we'll get into this in safety, but if a cell is abused subject to temperatures outside of its normal operating, currents, those kind of things, the jelly roll will start to crystallize. And then one of those little crystals will grow through the dielectric. Really? And then short the positive and negative inside of the cell. So this happens inside of the cell and it'll grow through and it'll short through the dielectric, separating the, um, uh, the two sides of the jelly roll. And then it'll go into thermal runaway. It'll heat up and go into thermal runaway. Uh, because of the internal short. That happens in lithium ion battery packs. Now, I will say this, there's, um, I, in the seven years that I've been here, we've only had one incident out of the millions, millions of cells that we've built into packs. One incident that we think may have been possibly caused by dendrite growth, but we're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually in a toilet flusher battery. The, the automatic toilet flushers in the bathrooms you go into, it was in one of those batteries uh, that it happened. Um, and we'll get into this when we're when we get into 
sourcing your cells. But if you buy a cell from a top tier manufacturer, Molly, Panasonic, LG, Samsung, those, you don't normally have to worry about this happening without abuse. Mm -hmm. But if you buy a cheap cell that's sort of a no name that came from a back alley somewhere, you got to worry about this and the quality of the. Because they use the different cell. materials or? They use cheaper materials. And the um, the formula isn't as pure, and then their process isn't as pure. So there's, you know, um, foreign debris inside of the uh, the 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 jelly roll that makes up the cell, and then that causes crystallization, mm -hmm. and then that causes dendrite growth. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you buy a top tier cell. But that's uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But lithium iron phosphate, um, it was designed as a drop in replacement for lead. So um, you can take these, a four series makes uh, your same 12 volt range as a lead acid would, eight series, the same as a 24 volt lead acid would. And so these are very popular in large applications. And these, uh, this chemistry is actually getting very popular in um, electric vehicle applications. Uh, a lot of companies are starting to develop lithium iron phosphate, large format battery packs because of the fires and mm -hmm. the problems they've had with lithium ion battery packs. Um, and then nickel metal hydride. Uh, this is the most popular replacement for, well, your alkaline based stuff, uh, your rechargeable batteries that you get for anything that takes double A's like a TV remote, stuff like that. Um, 1.5 volts charge, 1.3 to three to 1.2 volts nominal and one volt into discharge. And these aren't subject to testing requirements like, um, lithium based cells are so uh, like all of our packs we still build a lot of nickel metal hydride packs uh, that go into a lot of applications because they're not subject to the regulations mm -hmm. that the other packs are but they are nowhere near as any energy dense as the other two mm -hmm. so but they have the right not, voltage yes they have the right voltage so um, they're still used in a lot of rechargeable consumer applications, mm -hmm. user-replaceable kind of thing, you know. So basically, this is, uh, these uh, uh, voltages are also a reason why you can't use one charger to charge any rechargeable batteries because each battery is a little bit different. They need different uh, voltages, they need different currents and all these other stuff. Yes. Okay. Yes, each, each chemistry is different. Mm-hmm. And so um, if you stuck a, a, a lithium iron phosphate cell in a lithium ion charger, um, you'd overdrive it by, you know, 600 millivolts. And then the cell would vent and you'd have a mess to clean up. It wouldn't catch on fire, but it would vent and you'd have, a, you know, all the, all the um, stuff to clean up that came out of it. Mm -hmm. If you stuck a lithium ion cell into a... Um, lithium iron phosphate charger you probably would be okay it probably wouldn't wouldn't hurt it too bad um definitely if you stick a nickel metal into anything it would just blow it out it, it'd just be done you know so and what kind of batteries are uh because i already mentioned like rc planes or mm -hmm. rc cars or something mm -hmm. because rc planes i think the batteries they have to be light mm -hmm. so what kind of technology is there most of the time they use pouch cells, mm -hmm. small little pouch cells. Um, so PTI, who I work for, we used to do RC cars back in the day. That was that was our business until we got into actually building the batteries and stuff. And so they use small little polymers. And uh, some of the staff that works here still does that. And so they'll take polymers and, you know, they're supposed to be charged to 4.2 volts. And they'll take them and charge them up to, you know, 4.3, 4.5 volts, and they'll swell up a little bit to get a little more energy in them. And then they hammer them when those RC cars and RC planes are going when they're racing and stuff. And so is it a good idea? No, but does it work? Yeah, it works. But it's not a good idea. Okay. Uh, but but it does work. Okay, so we can move to the next one. Next okay. Slide. All right, this is... um talking about how cells go together. So cells aren't power supplies. So uh, you have to create a cell stack for your application. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is looking at like a, a lithium ion uh, battery pack, 3.6 volts nominal. So when you put them together in series, your voltage increases. And then when you put them in parallel, your um, capacity increases. 
So you put four together in series, it would be 14.4 volts nominal. Um, you put four together in parallel, it'd be 12 amp hours nominal. So if you did a, um, a 4S, 4P, or a 4 series 4 parallel, then it'd be a 14.4 volt, 12 amp hour battery pack. Mm -hmm. So when you see that, uh, when you're looking at battery packs and it says it's a 2S, 1P, or it says it's a 1P, it's a 1S, 3P, that means there's one in series and three in parallel, mm -hmm. two in series, one in parallel. Yeah, I understand now. And then basically, mm -hmm. Uh, all these uh, battery packs, they have some kind of standard voltages because I know like 7.2 is uh, kind of standard now or something. You say 14.4. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's all standard. So if you pick a lithium ion, you're going to go off of 3.6 volts. So if it's 7.2, there's two series mm -hmm. cells in it. Um, now, I will, I will say this, this is a pet peeve of mine. So... You have companies, especially drill battery companies, they'll say, well, it's a 20-volt pack or it's a 21-volt pack. And that's technically true, but that's peak charge voltage. Nominal voltage is 18 volts. Mm -hmm. So uh, you take, like, your Craftsman and your DeWalt and your uh, those type, they say 20-volt battery packs. But if you look at your Milwaukee, they say 18 volts. They're both true, just one's a market and... Thing versus the other one, you know. 20, 20 sounds better than 18, yeah. Yeah, it sounds better than 18, but it's the same It's the same cells, the same amount of voltage, the same amount of amp hours. It just sounds better. It's a marketing mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, and when it comes to um, testing standards and stuff and labeling the battery pack, you have to put the, the nominal voltage in the real, the real amp hours. You mm -hmm. don't have a choice there, mm -hmm. but... But marketing, marketing can do what they want, right? So. All right. Um, you so know, if you want to, we can talk. Usually, usually uh, I just jump between the slides, but your uh, slides are ordered perfectly, like exactly as they should be. So we don't have to jump all around. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I, I, I tried to lay it out if I was thinking... I was thinking if I was going to make a video about it, how would I want it laid out and how would I go? So that's that's the way I did it. Okay. So, so what is next? Next is testing, testing standards. Now this is a this is a big thing because not all batteries you're going to buy have been safety tested. And so especially the ones you buy kind of on Amazon and eBay and off of uh, you know AliExpress and those kind of things, they may not have been safety tested. And that's important. In the United States, they have uh, we do UN 38.3 transport testing. Uh, the battery pack is taken. Um, there's a whole bunch of voltage tests done to it. It's got to go through short circuit and over voltage and all those kind of things to make sure it can protect itself in those kind of environments. Then it's put onto a table, a shock table, a vibration table. I'm sure you've seen one before, and it yeah. vibrates at certain frequencies. Um, so that way to make sure the battery pack doesn't come apart. And those kind of things. And for any battery pack to be shipped, normal shipping in the United States, you have to have UN 38.3 testing. Mm -hmm. Now, Europe takes that a step further. So uh, nor the normal one for Europe is IEC 62133, which can be considered UL 62133. They're the same thing. Um, and so you have to have secondary protection. So... Um, we'll get into that when we get into the schematics, but you'll have to have secondary protection. So um, the main difference is they're going to do what's called a single fault test. So normally in a battery pack, you have your output fits. Well, they're going to short your output fits. They're going to put a jumper across it so they no longer work. So now you have to protect the battery pack without the output fits. So that adds a, another standard into it. And then there are some specialized standards. UL 2054 is um, a consumer battery standard that UL came out with that the FDA has adopted as a medical standard. It's very similar to 62133. We do a lot of medical products, and so we have to have secondary protectors on those. Uh, so for when you know, you're know you in a hospital, it, w it won't cause a problem. Because the last thing you want is a hospital burning down. Uh, you know, So... And then uh, 2580 is for electrical vehicles, 2020, 
2271 is for light electrical vehicles like um, bikes and scooters and things like that. New York City, uh, 2271, New York City passed a law where your batteries, your small electrical electrical vehicle batteries have to be 2271 certified because they've had over 200 fires and six fatalities from bootleg battery packs. Mm Mm-hmm got these people in their basements taking sales they buy off of uh, AliExpress and making their own battery packs and selling them. Well, you know, they're half the price, 30% of the price of a new one that's made by the manufacturer. So these people are taking them, putting them on their scooters and putting them on their hoverboards and putting them in their e-bikes, but they're not made safely and they haven't been tested. And so they, they burn, they've been burning apartment complexes down and burning and, um, a parking garage is down and all sorts of stuff because uh, they're not built correctly. And mm-hmm. the cells are cheap. And um, so they passed a law that says you have to have a UL certified battery if you're going to sell in New York City. This is very interesting because I think maybe unless someone really see what can happen when your battery starts a uh, fire or something, then I guess they will be like, Ah, uh, it's not going to happen, or it's not going. It's going to be nothing, but it can be really dangerous. Correct? It it can be very dangerous if you don't uh, if you don't have your battery pack tested. It can be very dangerous. Mm-hmm. And okay. so uh, that's one of the most important things is 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 testing standards. So you I see to... the next slide is about safety circuits. Yes, it is. So so we are getting um, closer. Like how to how to do this? Mm-hmm. So what is a safety circuit? Uh, so a safety circuit sets between whatever your load or charger is and the cell. Um, so it, it monitors the battery pack. It'll monitor the cell for things like over voltage and under voltage and things like that and protects the cell from whatever the output is. That is its job. Um, and so most safety circuits offer over voltage protection. So that prevents it from going past the 4.2 volt um, peak charge limit. If it goes over that, it'll cut off because the charger's not cutting off. Mm -hmm. It's the charger's job to charge the battery pack, but this is a secondary safety feature. So your safety circuit is not meant to be a system level component. It is not meant to cut off the battery when... um, your system gets too low of a voltage. Your system needs to do that. This is a secondary protection. It's emergency protection in case something goes wrong on the output. So this is usually so inside you, of the package. Battery. Uh, inside, inside of the of battery, the battery. Pack itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's something you need to note when you're designing your product is you, your product needs to, you know, cut off voltage earlier than the safety circuit would, those kind of things, because that's meant to be a last resort protection, not a system level component. Because maybe then someone will buy a battery from AliExpress without this protection and then... <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, it's uh, it's the 4th of July, you know, fireworks and sparkles and everything, you know, inside of your device. It's not a, it's not a good idea. Then okay. we got under voltage protection, which... Uh, uh, protects the cell from the being depleted past the end of discharge voltage. So um, for a lithium-ion cell, 2.5 volts per cell, normally that's a little higher, 2.6 or 2.7 volts per cell, um, to make sure you don't drive it past what its manufacturer's limit is. Then overcurrent in discharge, OCD, uh, prevents the load from drawing too much current. Mm-hmm. So each one of your cells has some kind of current rating. How much current can it supply? Can it one amps, two amps? That P26A we were looking at earlier, it can actually do 30 amps peak output with like a normal of 15 or something. It's a it's a power, so it can do a crazy amount of current. Um, but it makes sure you can't pull too much current out of it because mm-hmm. if you pull too much current out of it, it can damage the insides, lead to dendrite growth, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with charge. It uh, prevents too much charge current. So if you have a charger that's gone rogue and it's just putting out as much wattage as it can, then you want to make sure the battery pack doesn't get driven. Uh, so the, the more current you drive, the more the voltage is going to rise, and then the hotter the cell is going to get, the more runaway. Mm-hmm. Um, also, over temperature. This is very important. Over temperature. cuts off the battery output when the temperature is too high. Mm-hmm. Um, 
a lot of your smaller safety circuits, the one we're going to look at, doesn't integrate temperature protection. Uh, but there is a thermistor that your device can measure to cut off if it needs to. Mm-hmm. I and remember a, my phone, a, like, thermal warning uh, when I was recording in very hot. Once I went oh, yeah. uh, to JLCPCB and uh, into the room with ovens, and there was like 50 degrees or something, and I was recording for like 10 minutes, and my phone was thermal mm-hmm. warning, thermal, and it switched off. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll uh, uh, shut off. I've left my phone in you know the dashboard of the car, and you know you come back and it shut off. It's like nope, you got to cool me down, that kind of thing. <laughs> so and and they get hot. Phones get hot now especially hot with the processors and stuff in them, they get warm. And then uh, I don't know if you ever use fast charging on your cell phone, but the battery in, in it will get hot if you use fast charging. I don't use fast charging because um, uh, if you use fast charging, um, the heat and cooling cycle will make your battery lose capacity faster. Mm-hmm. Now, it's eventually going to lose capacity anyway once it ages enough. But... um It'll make it lose capacity faster. Mm-hmm. Also, um, I've got an S23, but I don't know what kind of phone you carry, but it has um, a short charge mode. So my phone will only charge up to 85%. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I have it set to. So that way that saves a little bit of battery life. If you're not fully charging and fully just charging it, that saves a little bit of battery life and helps you prolong it. So it's still valid? Bit, so. Because I think a uh, long time ago, this was... The thing, like, uh, do not charge it fully, do not discharge fully. But then I thought they somehow solved this or maybe, like, made make it more intelligent or something. So it's still the thing. Yeah, they, they've made it a lot more intelligent. I think the um, it, the 7s had, pro- had a real bad problem. The S7s had a real bad problem with that, and the batteries were actually catching on fire because they were overcharging. Um, but... Um, it has to do with uh, with cell life. So if you take a cell and you charge it to peak charge voltage and into discharge voltage, it's not going to last as long if you charge it somewhere in a window in the middle. Mm-hmm. So you only charge it to 4.1 volts or 4 volts, and then you only discharge it to 2.8 volts. It's just going to last a lot longer because you're not working it as hard. Mm-hmm. So okay. That's interesting. It only has... So lithium ion only has three to five hundred discharge cycles. That is what they're rated at. And so if you short, yeah, three hundred to five hundred discharge cycles. This is one year. That is what the manufacturers rate them at. That makes people upset when you tell them that they're like, "No way!" And that that is true. That's what the manufacturers rate them at: three to five hundred cycles. Lithium iron phosphate is a couple of thousand cycles. Um. So if you short charge, if you do it within a window, that three to five hundred cycles is going to increase some percentage, 30 percent, twenty five to thirty more percent, and so you'll get a, li- a couple hundred more cycles out of that by short charging it. Mm-hmm. So um, I should have put that in the slide up up top, and I didn't think about it. <laughs> I apologize for that. That would have been a good thing to talk about. No, no, but we didn't forget, so that's good. Yep. So. Um, yeah, this is, if you want to integrate something like that into your device, your device would need to do that. The safety circuit won't do that. It's for a safety event. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. if you wanted to short charge, you'd put that into your device. Mm-hmm. I understand. All right, now to safety circuits. Uh, and this go, is a, no, no, did we finish oh, the list? Oh, I don't believe we talked about short circuit. Yeah. Um, we talked about temperature. Now, short yeah, circuit... Yeah is um, short circuit on the output. If something happens and the battery pack output was to short, it will cut the output off and make sure that the battery pack um, is protected. Um, Some of your um, cheaper BMSs you buy off AliExpress and stuff don't offer short circuit protection. We've gotten several of them in and they're like welders. You go to short the battery pack and it's just this huge big old arc that happens. Uh, because it has no short circuit protection. So you definitely need this um, short circuit protection. Um, that is a must to have in any kind of safety circuit. Okay, so how does it look? How this safety circuit looks? So this is a uh, like real yeah. example. This is a real cheap. Yes. Okay. This is a this is a real circuit that is um that is on this battery pack right here. That is a circuit that is on this battery pack right here. So it, it is uh 
uh, one I, uh, one uh, that we put on our battery pack. So um, this is your main chipset. Uh, so this is your controller. This senses everything. Mm -hmm. And so this is a one series um, lithium ion, you know, 3.6 volts nominal. Over voltage protection for this is between 4.26 and 4.3 volts. Um, under voltage is between 2.66 and 2.74. The reason it's a range is because of the tolerance of the chip mm -hmm. plus the tolerance of the resistor. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be a range. Um for uh, a chip like this. Now, um, there are different types of safety circuits. This is what we call a non-smart chip. So it's already pre-programmed with all of its limits, and then you just integrate it into your device. However, there are smart chipsets. And so with smart chipsets, they can be calibrated, and you input all of your settings yourself but they're a lot more complicated to integrate into a device. Mm -hmm. So these these you just throw on and you have a range. So overcurrent discharge, 2.6 to 3.7 amps. Overcurrent charge, 2 to 2.7 amps. And then it has a fuse set at 4 amps. So um, uh, you have your current sense resistor. This is how it figures out how much current is flowing. It's all voltage-based. So... Um, it has a certain millivolt range that it can read. Um, so, so first, maybe explain. Uh, so, uh, on the left, there are the there is there are the connections to the battery, and on the right, basically, these are the pins going out of the battery pack. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yes. So this is your input. These are your input pads um, for coming off of the cell, mm -hmm. and then this is your output going out of your battery pack, whatever mm -hmm. your harness is. Um, and so you have sense lines that measure uh, the the rail voltage, your battery pack voltage, or your cell voltage. Mm -hmm. And then you have your current sense resistor. And so this is sized to whatever your millivolt trip level is. So if I just do some quick math, um, this is set to um, 3 amps at 12 milliohms, so it would be a 36 millivolt trip limit. That's what the data sheet says. I will trip over current and discharge at 36 millivolts. Mm -hmm. So you set your current sense resistor to whatever you want mm -hmm. that trip limit to be at 36 millivolts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it senses that, and then you have your output fits. And you notice they're back-to-back. -back. That's to prevent current flowing in both directions. Mm-hmm. So charge current and discharge current. So um, whenever a flag happens, whenever uh, this sees over voltage or over current or something, it shuts off both vets. Mm -hmm. Make sure no current can flow in either direction. It shuts mm -hmm. off both vets. Um, and then it has this sense line, which senses whether a charger present or whether the load has been taken off so it can reset itself and let the battery back go back to normal operation. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, here is your thermistor. So that's for a charger to monitor. That's for your device to monitor, to monitor the battery, to make sure nothing bad is happening to it. So this specific chip does not uh, support um, over temperature. Um, no kind of temperature whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We let the device do that. So some of them are made with it and some of them are not. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go to the next safety oh, circuit, wait, wait, this wait, is... Wait, wait, because I have a question about this one. I remember once okay. I uh, disassembled a, a battery because... It looked like it was dead, but actually when I measured it, it wasn't. And I and I found out that these chips, they may have, uh, there are different kind of chips. Some of them, they will get stuck. Some of them you can somehow reset. Some of them will recover themselves. So can we talk a little bit about this? Yes, uh, chipset recovery. So um, some of them will, um, when they have a fault, depending on what it is, um, but if it has a fault, it will not recover until it sees a charger. Mm -hmm. So it has to see positive voltage on the, on the output uh, before it will recover from a fault. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have a, a lockout. So if the battery voltage, if the cell voltage over here gets too low, it'll lock out. Mm -hmm. And um, once it gets below a certain threshold, it's locked out and it will not let anything happen anymore. Yeah, I think that's what happened on my battery. Mm -hmm. So it, it um, because I, I connected charger and nothing was happening. There was like no current, nothing like. 
So uh, some chipsets have a zero volt charge feature, which means it'll let it charge if it's below the threshold, if it sees a um, if it sees a current input. And some of them don't. Most of them do not. If you have a battery pack that's you know below whatever safety shutdown is, so you know you have your two and a half volt end of discharge voltage, which is fine. It's perfectly safe there. But if you go down to like two or one point eight, then it may not be a good idea to recover that cell mm -hmm. because you could have some kind of internal problems. Mm -hmm. So the chipset will say it's way below whatever the safety limit I have in my, and that's pre-programmed in this mm -hmm. inside of the, the, the ROM of the chip. If it's, you know, goes 1.5 volts per cell, I'm going to shut off and not turn back on. Mm -hmm. So this may happen, for so, example, if you have a battery which will be in your, I don't know, on your table for two years never charge, and then you try to charge it, then it's kind of dead because... Yeah, it's dead because the, the safety circuit decided it's not recoverable. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so, I, I understand now what happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, these have some kind of quiescent current, so they they have some kind of nano amps that they're drawing from the battery pack continuously, so, you know, that's drawing it down, and then lithium-based chemistry is discharged, self-discharged, they lose capacity at about a percent a month. So you leave it on the shelf for two years, it's probably going to be dead when you go back, mm -hmm. especially if it was dead when you put it on the shelf. We get a lot of RMAs back here to where the customer, the, the battery pack had a problem. It got into some kind of overcurrent event or something, and they thought it was broke, and they set it on the shelf, and two years goes by, and they send it back to us in the cell stack, and it's completely dead, mm -hmm. not recoverable. And uh, it's like, we're like, if you just stuck it in a charger, it would have been fine, you know. But most of the most of the fails, uh, the fail states of these can be reset with a charger. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you put in a charge circuit, it'll 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 re restart just fine. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to cheat a little bit and not have a charger, uh, I can give you this tip. However, this is not. Uh, let me say this: this is not um, safe. But you can short, normally you can short your battery ground to your power ground, short around this, and it'll fool the chip into thinking it's being charged, this and it'll reset need. the flag. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just short, the, short them two together. It'll fool it. Um, so I've got another safety circuit, circuit to show you. Okay. Um, this is a two series. So uh, same type of setup. Um, and... Uh, the same company makes this chip, Ryko. This is a Ryko chip, and that's a Ryko chip. This is a two series, so 7.2 volts, mm -hmm. nominal. Over voltage, um, under voltage, overcurrent discharge, overcurrent charge, and then your fuse is at 5 amps. This will do a little bit more current than the other one would. But you have your same thing. You have your battery inputs here. You also have a common leg. So um, a, a chipset will measure all of the cells to make sure all of the cells are correct mm -hmm. uh, whenever it's looking at voltages. So you have a common leg that goes in between the two cells. So you have cell one negative, cell one positive, and then cell two positive. Um, whenever you're looking at BMS chips, let me make a note of this. Whenever you're looking at chipsets, cell one is always your lowest cell in the stack. So um, you're, uh, you always have... Sometimes it's called ground, sometimes it's called cell zero, which is your ground, mm -hmm. and then cell one positive, cell two positive. It's always at the bottom of the stack, mm -hmm. uh, of your series stack. So it would be, this is your ground, and this is your main positive. This would be cell one. Mm -hmm. This would be two and three and four. It always starts from the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, whenever you're looking at that. So uh, same thing, you have your output fetch, you have your current sense resistor. Now, this chipset does a little different. If you notice, it does not have an R-Sense line like um, like that one does. Mm -hmm. you are so, right. so this one has an R-Sense line that goes here. This one does not. Mm -hmm. This one looks at the difference between VSS and V- minus and calculates the current. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing here, what I'm doing here is manipulating the series resistance. So the FET has some kind of series resistance. Even though it's not much, we're talking about millivolts and milliohms, so it does make a difference because it's such a high sensitivity circuit. 
So what I can do is I can put a series resistance here and make this whole section be the trip limit I want it to be within the range, mm -hmm. right? So we've used these Eddie, uh, Alpha and Omega 8814s for years. They're pretty stable in what their series resistance is, their on resistance is. So I can take and fudge this. I have a 33 milliohm resistor in here. Fudge this uh, with a series resistance to get my trip limit. So that's that's a trap for people who are just getting into designing safety circuits, and they find one like this that does not have a current sense line, and they put it on there, and the current's way off from what mm -hmm. they calculated it to be because of this series resistance. Mm -hmm. So that's just something to look at uh, when you're integrating something like this into your design. Um. Uh, integrating this into your design circuit integration. Um, most oh, yeah, of the time, I, I see you, it on the pictures where it is. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, you yeah. buy these off the shelf, and they come with the safety circuits. Mm -hmm. They come with the data sheet. This is what current it'll do. This is its trip points. That kind of thing. Um, this is one that we build off the shelf. One of our PSPs. It has a um, the circuit on the very top mm -hmm. of the button. Uh, or you could do, uh, a lot of people do bare cells. You get like a cell holder from Keystone, and you throw a cell into it, uh, but then you have to integrate this protection on board your design. Mm -hmm. So this protection has to be somewhere. You could risk not having the protection and sort of do it kind of system side. I would not recommend that. I've seen people, some people try to do that. It's not, it doesn't really work out great. You need to have protection on the battery pack. So whether you put protection with a cell holder or you just buy an off-the-shelf battery, um, you need to have uh, protection. Now, I do have a, um, a few websites for reference, if you okay. want to see, yeah, yeah. that you can order cells from. Um, so um, this is SparkFun. Uh, this is a, um, a website you can buy. Uh, batteries from and so you see there's a lot of, of of pouch cells available and they all have safety circuits mm -hmm. um so here two amp hours 400 milliamp hours these are all 3.6 volts um here's a bigger one six amp hours and you can also buy bare cells now i want you to notice here um you see this one 62133 certified mm -hmm. so this one can ship to europe mm-hmm um, oh, that's then, why sometimes when you when some things are shipped, then uh, batteries must be not included or removed because mm -hmm. uh, if they don't use these certified batteries, you can't really use them for shipping. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, those are uh, Europe's very very strict on their rules for battery packs. Very very strict on that, um, and other countries are too. Um, India is one that's very strict on that. Korea is extremely strict. Getting getting a battery product in Korea is a nightmare, um, as far as the testing and stuff goes. It is uh, it is very hard. Uh, China's not very hard. They're a little more strict than the U.S. Is the U.S. actually has for just normal batteries and normal battery packs? They are very lax on the rules as far as industrial battery goes. Now, for medical products, we do a lot of medical products, intrinsically safe, going into um, fire and mines and stuff like that. They're very strict on mm -hmm. that. But for just a, a normal industrial battery pack, there you know you get transport testing, and that's about it. There's no specialized testing, mm -hmm. I guess is what I would say. Um, but I guess anything what, I don't know, people can take to on plane or something, are there special requirements, like... In, in uh, the yes, there, of... there is a uh, a watt hour requirement. So um, I don't know off the top of my oh, head. Oh, hundred watts a... or, and, or something like this. So hundred oh, or eighty. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. I know because once uh, I took my uh, bank USB bank, <laughs> and mm -hmm. they, you know, uh, they say like, no, no, you can't take this on plane, and it was a really so, good one. <laughs> There's a there's a minimum uh, a minimum watt hour rating that you can take on consumer airplanes, mm -hmm. um, passenger airplanes, um, and then there are IATA rules uh, for going uh, non uh, passenger airplanes. So we ship packs on on planes, mm -hmm. 
but they can only be 30% state of charge, mm -hmm. and you have to certify that they're only 30% state of mm -hmm. charge. And then they have to be specially packaged, and the shipping is a lot more. It's just, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are very, very big restrictions um, in shipping on planes. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for just a second. <clears throat> You got a little bit choked up there. You can drink um, something if you like. Oh, I would love to drink something. So. You are good. No, I, don't... I, I really like this. Like, I love it. Very interesting. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Am I doing good so far? Oh, perfect. It's like, it's really, good. really good. 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 Um, where were we talking about? Planes? So you opened this website. Yeah. Like uh, I did. So this is um, Adafruit. This is another website that sells um, battery packs that mm -hmm. you can buy. Here's a, um, a you know a pouch sale, um, and then here's a couple of what I was talking about before. So this has two cells in it. It's a one series, a two parallel. Here's a three parallel. Here's another three parallel with some higher amp hour cells in it. Most of the cells you're going to buy are three point seven volts. Mm -hmm. Most of them you are going to buy. And so, how do you know if these are protected, the blue ones? Do they have the protection um, or not? So if we um, if we open it in a different tab, um, you can um, go normally to the technical details. Uh, see, this mm -hmm. has a UN thirty eight point three report. So it would be protected. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that when you pick a battery pack, it at least has that UN 38.3 report. So I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but it, it will detail all of the tests that it went through. Your nominal voltage, your capacity, and then at somewhere in the report, usually at the bottom, yeah, here's some pictures. So here's pictures of the cell, and then they'll tear it down. There's the safety circuit that's in it. Mm -hmm. So if you look, there's your... This would be a safety circuit comparable to this one right here. Mm -hmm. So if you want to look at how it would be laid out. So if you're looking, there's your chipset. Here is your series FETs. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any series resistance. Mm -hmm. So they're just relying on whatever the resistance of the FETs are. Uh, but there's two of them in parallel. So this can carry a little bit more current than just a single one would. Um, so... On these, this is a dual package FET. So it has two back-to-back -back FETs in it. And then they're parallel together. And so um, it would have a safety circuit like this on it. So when you buy a battery pack, you need to make sure that it has the 38.3 report and all of those kind of things to make sure it has been safety tested. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Europe, IC62133. Mm -hmm. um, and then the data sheet will give all of the, the parameters and stuff for it. Um, I did also look at DigiKey. Um, DigiKey has several options as well. Um, so um, they have several options that you can get all sorts of different uh, kind of packages. And you can see the safety circuits mm -hmm. um, underneath the capital. Tank. You can also buy bare cells and different things uh, from DigiKey as well. Just make sure that they have been transport tested and 62133 mm -hmm. tested well that that's a, that's a major thing you need to make sure that they have been tested um, um if if not just for your own safety for you know insurance purposes so if this thing you know damages some of your property you want to be well i brought a properly tested battery pack and integrated this into my device you know and all that kind of things so i would now i will be more careful when selecting batteries <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Just just throwing one in there is not normally a good idea. You need to make you know do a little bit of research. It doesn't take a lot of research. You can usually find what you're looking for pretty quick. But it, you know just make a little bit of the effort to try yeah. to find it. What I'm thinking about is like uh, really people buying from I don't know AliExpress and <laughs> yes, that's it's just not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. Um, you're going to pay a little bit more when you buy from other websites, but you won't pay for it in the end, right? So you yeah. have to pay so, with a piece of property. So this or may be the like difference that. between the cheap batteries and the normal batteries. 
It's a big difference. It's a big difference. Transport ta- transport testing is is uh, many thousands of dollars, and you have to send packs. So, um, transport testing you have to send sixteen battery packs, and it takes about eight weeks. And they go through a whole slew of tests, and then IEC testing is another twenty battery packs, I think, on top of the transport testing battery packs that you have to send, and they have to all be tested. And so, if you've got little batteries like these. You know, little batteries like these, what, what's that going to cost you as far as the cell cost goes? Not much. But if you've got big batteries, uh, some of the batteries we build, you know, they're many hundreds of dollars. So sending those off to testing is tens of thousands. Now you're into the tens of thousands of dollars. So uh, you're going to pay more for a battery like this. You are definitely going to pay. This one's, you know, $5.00. This little battery right here, 400 milliamp hours, where you would buy that from AliExpress for a dollar, maybe 75 cents. But it's been tested. So it's, the choice is really up to you, whatever you want to risk, right? So, yeah. Okay, so the next on your list is how do we charge them, I think. How do we charge the circuit? Yes. So, um, uh, charging the circuit, uh, the, the, uh, this is a, a common charging circuit. Now, this is a little bit more of a sophisticated one. There are cheaper ones that just kind of do input-output at a constant current, and you can't set any of it. I use the uh, VQ24109 in a lot of my designs, and a lot of them. It's a great chip. It's a little bit more expensive than the cheaper ones, but you can set a lot more things. Mm-hmm. So uh, you have your input connector here and some stabilizing capacitors here. Um, and it's got a lot of features. So current is the is the big one, right? This is a, a lithium a lithium ion battery charger, so it already has all the voltage stuff built in. It'll do four point two volts and all that kind of stuff. Um, so current is the big thing. So um, this one you can set the current limit. Mm-hmm. So it has two two current settings, and so you can set your current limit, which is what the battery pack can charge at. This is set to 1.6 amps. Mm-hmm. This is what it can charge at. And then your termination current. So if I go back to the graph here, um, uh, this would be a charge graph as well, just in the other direction, right? And so up here at your um, end of this charge voltage, um, you, you need a thing called um, taper current. So the battery will go up to 4.2 volts and it'll hold there. And the, you're able to put a little bit more energy into it. So you peak out at, at, you're running at 1.6 amps and then it peaks out at 4.2 volts and your charger holds that there. It's constant current, constant voltage. So your, your charger clamps the voltage at 4.2 volts. And so your, your current naturally begins to taper because the battery pack isn't taking as much wattage. Well, you have to stop that at some point. If you leave the constant current on the cell at its peak charge voltage, you'll eventually drive it into some kind of fault condition mm-hmm. because it will keep taking a little bit of leakage current. It will never stop taking current. So uh, because of the way, just the way the, the cells are made. And so that little bit of leakage current held on it will eventually damage the cell. Mm-hmm. So you need a thing called charge termination current. Mm-hmm. So usually that's around 150 to 200 milliamps, no matter how big your pack is. Mm-hmm. So if you have a six parallel, uh, if you have a, um, uh, a a two series six parallel pack, you know, 7.2 volts and it's like 12 amp hours, termination current still going to be the same. Um, to about 200 milliamps per cell. Mm-hmm. So um, whatever your termination current needs to be, and and that's not a hard fast rule the more you get in parallel the more you get in series you can adjust that you know mm-hmm. because you um, say per, per cell per cell yes okay. yeah terminate current usually per cell but the more you get in in, in series and parallel you can lower that down some so um but when you get to peak charge and you're at 4.2 volts you're not going to get that much more energy so you've got a 2.6 amp hour cell you're probably at 2.55 amp hours by the time you've reached peak voltage and then your termination current's down to, you know, 500 milliamps 
for 750 milliamps. You're you're right at the cusp of it being fully charged anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not going to get that much more. You know, you're going to get like a half a percent more into the battery pack. Mm-hmm. So um, we have some customers that worry to death about that, having the cell fully charged to its max, you know, as much current as it can take. Uh, you're not going to get, you're not going to see in your product that amount of, you're not going to see that benefit really in your, in your product. Is this because, is this the reason why when you, for example, charge your phone, it will charge up to 98% quickly and then it will keep, I don't know, for another half an hour charging for yep. the rest of the 2%? Yep. Yep. Okay. That's exactly why. Because you can shove a bunch of energy into it while it's while it can while it's in, you know, the middle of its charge range. So, you know, think of this graph in reverse. You can shove a bunch just like you can take a bunch of energy out of it in the discharge curve, you can shove a bunch of energy back into it here. Just pump the current into it. But once you get up near this region and the voltage clamps, the the cell stack just isn't taking it just can't take that much current anymore. It just falls off. Mm-hmm. So, um, so basically, it does not really. If if your phone is charged up to ninety eight percent, eight percent, you don't really do anything bad if you just remove it from charger and use it. No. Okay. You're not going to see the benefit of that two percent. Really, you're just not. And some phones, once it once it reaches ninety eight ninety nine percent, it'll go ahead and say it's a hundred percent charged. <laughs> It'll just go ahead and cut off. Um, And so that is set by this. So at what point do you want it to cut off? So once it reaches 4.2 volts and then it starts to taper, the current starts to tape off, what point do you want to cut it off? Mm -hmm. So your charge terminate current, which is set by I set 2 here for the 24109, what do you want that to be? You could set it to be 500 milliamps. You could set it to be an amp. You could Mm -hmm. set it to be 250 milliamps. What do you want that cut off to be? How long do you want to wait for the charger to finish? This charger has indicators on it. So you've got a power good indicator, and then you've got a um, a status indicator, and it's made to drive a bicolor LED, a a red and a green. And so how long do you want to wait for that to turn from red to green? So that's that's really what it is, because your your energy at that point is not that much. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so we we had a product with this particular chipset in it um, where they were using an 18650 cell and they went to a 21700 cell and the um, so if you look here TTC pin that is your timeout pin that is how long the chipset will try to charge the battery pack before it gives up Mm-hmm. If your battery doesn't charge in six hours, it cuts off. If mm-hmm. it doesn't charge in eight hours, it cuts off. Well, the 21700 was about 40% more capacity. So the timing capacitor was cutting out before the battery pack was fully charged. So if we'd have taken, you know, the, the terminate current up a little bit, it may have fixed it, but we ended up changing the timing capacitors. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is just a fancy regulator. That's all this is, is a fancy regulator with switching. Um so you have your, your tank circuit here, you have your capacitors and your inductor here, which is dependent on your charge on your input voltage. So, so what is the input this, voltage for this one? Five volts. Five volts? For this one. No, this one's twelve volts. I believe this one's twelve volts input voltage. Oh it says that uh, we in mean five volts? No, this is yeah, five volts. Okay. That's right, this one. I I use this chipset in a lot of different applications. So you just set your tank circuit according to your input voltage. There's mm-hmm. a formula for that. And that's just as simple as that. It has a, a current sense resistor so it can sense the current, and it just does it all itself. There's really no setup for it. You set your, your current, and then um, there's a thermistor divider here. So if you're using a 10K NTC, which is what, what I use, you set your... Um, circuit like this so it can measure the thermistor here mm-hmm. and then it'll it'll just go that's so, as simple oops. as a charge circuit is so where do you connect the thermistor you have only two pins on your j2 header oh so it uses the um power ground as a reference for that 
And you don't need to connect to this TH uh, pad? Yes. Um, so in this particular in this particular circuit, um, I copied this out of one of my designs. This TH1 actually mm -hmm. went to a separate mm -hmm. pad. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I didn't reference that. But yeah, the TH1 went to a separate pad. Mm -hmm. um, and so TH1 would connect to TH1 in this circuit, and then this would be your positive and negative. And um, it is um, referenced to the ground of the circuit. Mm -hmm. Some of the larger chipsets use uh, what's called a discrete thermistor. So you have it's differential. So um, in your uh, circuit, you would actually bring out the both sides mm -hmm. of the thermistor, and then it, it measures it differentially instead of being referenced to mm -hmm. ground. Um, and so that is uh, uh, that is how a charge circuit works. And the BQ twenty four one hundred nine is a great it's a it's a great charge. I see. It's a little more expensive than the cheaper ones that haven't got all the features, but I like to see the LEDs. I like to be able to set the current. I like to be able to set the timing, and I like to be able to set the thermistor reference. So it mm -hmm. um, gives you a lot more control. So you have um, a couple of more circuits in Altium, correct? Yes, I do. So um, integrating this into your product, I have a few integration schematics. Um, so this is the first one. So... In, whenever you have, um, uh, whenever you have your your battery pack um, integrated into your design, you know, like a, a pair of Bluetooth earbuds or AirPods or uh, those kind of applications, they charge separately from use. Mm -hmm. So you, use you can't you use them it. when you charge them. Mm-hmm. And so this would be a circuit like that. You, you don't use it when you charge it. Yeah, this is, you know, sometimes I bought the uh, haircut machine and it was yeah. like, don't use it uh, when you charge it. It's like, what? Like, what? Yep. <laughs> yep. I, my, my beard trimmer's like that. It's, it, you got to charge it separate, you know? <laughs> yep. Uh, the reason you do that is because you integrate a, a cheaper circuit like this. Um. So you have it, your, your charge IC, which I use the 24109 in this. Um, so you have your charge IC. Again, it's set up the same way. I just have a barrel jack here. And I did forget to put the thermistor output on this connector. But you have your thermistor to your battery. Mm -hmm. So this is assuming your battery has its own safety mm -hmm. or you've integrated that already. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it goes, and this is, you know, 5 volts at 2 amps if you have... Um, a high current battery. Now that's adjustable. So if you have like an ESP32 or an Arduino where you don't need that much current, you only need a 30 milliamps, 50 milliamps, then you can adjust all this accordingly. You know, you wouldn't need a, a 10 watt adapter. You mm -hmm. only need like a two watt adapter. And you wouldn't need to charge at 1.6 amps. You just charge at you know, 500 milliamps or something. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you got your LED indicators here, your neg uh, your red and your green for indicating the status of the chip. Mm -hmm. And then you just have a uh, your buck boost, which uh, holds your rail to 3.3 volts. So you're starting out at 4.2 volts peak charge, 3.6, 3.7 volts nominal, but you're into discharge is 2.5. So you need to boost that, buck boost that, you know. And so you'd have a switch. And so you'd only have it turn on whenever you weren't charging. Is it going to be a problem if you if you switch it on when... Ah, because the characteristic of the battery charging mm -hmm. circuit will change. Because mm -hmm. you suddenly, you drive, for example, more current than just the battery or I don't know why. What are the reasons why you can't switch it on when you are charging? The, this, there are several factors to this. So... This wouldn't be a bad problem for the battery. This would be a problem for the charging circuit because mm -hmm. now the charging circuit has a constant load on it, so mm -hmm. it'll never shut off. Mm -hmm. So you'll never see it, you'll never see it go green because it'll never shut off. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't bother you, you could probably do it. Also, your charger needs to be able to supply more current than this takes in order to charge the battery. So if your buck boost circuit is an amp and your charger is only 800 milliamps, then you're going to drain your battery. Mm -hmm. 
right? So you need to make sure it can supply more current than this can take. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I remember. Can... I remember. I have like small hand vacuum cleaner with so small adapter. I don't know, five hundred milliamps or something, mm -hmm. and uh, you could only use the uh, vacuum cleaner from the battery because only the battery yep. was able to actually deliver so much current as the motor really needed. But yep. to save money, they created very small charger and that was the reason why you couldn't use it when you were charging the battery. Yep. And that's the reason because uh, this basically becomes a DC power supply. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it does. It basically becomes a power supply. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not really designed to be a power supply. So there can be some integration issues with doing it just directly. Mm -hmm. um, now you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to have the switch in here again, or, or, you know, you get one of the DC jacks that has the, um, the make or break yeah, yeah, yeah. I in know. it, you know, or, or one of those, or you could integrate some kind of automated logic here to turn this on and off. Again, you wouldn't have to, there just may be some integration issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you'd have to experiment with it. But again, it wouldn't be a danger to the battery itself doing it directly. It's just that this would have to be able to supply as much current as this needed plus charge the battery. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to be able to charge the battery pack while you have an input, that's what these are. I'll show you this schematic mm -hmm. here. That's what this is. This is called a, uh, a power path controller. Mm -hmm. So power path controller. So basically, mm -hmm. you switch the path how the currents will flow. If it flows directly mm -hmm. to the load or if it flows to the battery. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we work with a lot of these. Um, our customers have a lot of these integrated into their systems, and so we work with them. This one's a standalone version that Texas Instrument State makes. This is a BQ twenty four one thirty three. Also. Um, the 2416 is a real popular uh, uh, chip as well to use in power integration, uh, but they make some that are software settable. They're a little more complicated to work with. You know, the ones that do USB power delivery and and um, um, can do uh, dual power rail input and output power and all those things, <laughs> but th those are a lot more complicated to work with. Those would be, that would make a good video in itself, just talking about those chips specifically. Because power delivery is complicated. Oh, it's it very complicated. Extremely complicated. Um, so, uh, oh, what you have... Yeah. Yeah, USB-C is extremely complicated. Uh, so, what I have here... Now, this is an untested circuit. This is um, a project I'm working on uh, for... Um, uh, this is a personal project I'm working on. So, I haven't actually tested the integration for this yet. I've done all the calculations but I'm not sure exactly if it'll work yet. Okay. Um, uh, but what we have here is a BQ24133 power path controller. You have your input jack here, which is 9 to 12 volts, and then you have back-to-back -back FETs again that control um, uh, your current in both directions. So if your battery is on, you're not back-feeding into whatever you have on this and, and vice versa. Uh, so what this chip does is it... Um, will charge and discharge depending on what the situation is. Mm -hmm. So if you look here, here's where your battery connects, and this is your switch line, and there is a buck boost circuit in here that will charge your battery pack um, along with manage the power over the rail. So if you have a you know 9 to 12 volts, just regular old wall pack, into that, it passes that to the system. And then it uses the excess power to charge the battery pack. If you pull this out, now the battery pack goes to the system to power it. Um, and so these, these power pack controllers are really great. They have a status LED. You can set the current with these. Um, you see your current set here. You can set um, uh, your battery charge current here. And then your taper current is a percentage of that. Um, so some of the bigger chips, you can set both in this chip, you set your main current and then your taper currents, a percentage of that. And then you have your AC set, which is your 
current here. You see a current sense resistor. Mm -hmm. So it can detect overcurrent coming from the wall pack. If the system goes, something happens to the system, it goes rogue. It can protect your, your, your wall pack as well. Um, uh, it can measure a, um, its own thermistor mm -hmm. to check and make sure everything's okay. Now for this particular chip, it does not have a thermistor measure to the battery. It only does plus and minus. So you have to make sure that whatever safety you integrate into the battery, you need um, thermal protection, mm -hmm. a thermal breaker or something, uh, something like that, which they make bigger power pack controllers that do have a, a battery thermistor monitor. And uh, so uh, this is an ideal diode to make sure that the two rails don't uh, fight each other. So only current can flow in one direction mm -hmm. to, uh, to the system. And so um, this is really, really great for integrating into your product, especially if you have a hot swap of a battery. So if you have a battery that you need to, you want to change them out, this is really great for that. So you have, you have a product with a battery in it, and then you can also plug it into the wall and charge it but you also want to have the option to swap the battery out in case the battery's dead. This is really great for that. Um, it's really great if you want to just plug the battery in too. So you can you could set this to a five volt system, and then you know put a buck boost or something out here to keep the rail or a three volt system, and then put like a five volt um, input here and do some low power stuff. There's just a lot of options when using a power delivery chipset. I've set this one. Um, to um, 7.2 volts because mm -hmm. that's the project I'm working on. And uh, it'll do um, a 2-amp system current limit mm -hmm. on this sense resistor and then a 1.5-amp charge current limit mm -hmm. here. Um, and then uh, the whole entire rail over voltage protection is 17.6 volts. Usually you set that to way above what it should be just in case some kind of transient happens or something like that. And so um, that is the end of uh, end of everything I've got. This was so cool. I, I really like this a lot, Alex. So thank you so much for preparing all these materials and explaining. Well, you're very much welcome. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you oh. for having me. Oh, oh, oh. We, we almost forgot. You didn't tell anything about yourself. Like you, you say you are designing these batteries, but uh can we oh can you talk yes. about maybe your company or so um i'm alex norman uh i'm the design and development engineer here at pro technologies located in pilot mountain north carolina and uh, i'm a bms designer i design the the safety circuits the battery management systems that go on battery packs and we've got a great team of engineers here and um and uh, we, we design custom batteries, everything from defibrillator batteries to the um, the toilet flusher batteries I was talking about earlier. We design all sorts of stuff. And so that's been my day job for the past seven years. And then I uh, also have my own social media as well. Um, that's my logo here, the, the EET Engineer. I'm on YouTube, Instagram. You can open your LinkedIn. YouTube, I think. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yes, I have it here. Yeah. So I'm on YouTube and I have a, a BMS design series. I'm actually started talking about how to design your own BMS. Um, and then I'm also on LinkedIn and TikTok and Instagram and all, all the social medias. Okay. So if someone would like to learn more, then uh, they can watch your videos. Or, yes. Or possibly people could leave comments if there are some other topics what we could talk about and maybe create future videos. Or if they great. need special solutions, maybe they can contact you or your company and, and you know, maybe yes. maybe they you can work together with them. I don't know. That would be awesome if you get some customers off this video. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I would be very happy if it helped because, uh, because I really, you know, appreciate everything what you prepared today. Like it was a lot of work and if I can help a little bit, I will be very, very happy. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah, thank so you. Thank you very much, I'll, Alex. I really enjoyed this I'll, recording. I learned a lot. And now 
finally I can, you know, use batteries in my <laughs> in my products because it may look like it's a simple topic, but uh, when I started thinking like, shall I put rechargeable battery into my, I don't know, toy or something? And I was like, uh, I just buy standard battery and it's going to be much easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. so there's a lot of stuff to consider when yeah. you're integrating it. Now I know which one it is. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much, Alex. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, that's everything. Thank you very much for watching this video. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel online courses, where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye.